Hello and welcome back to Dogs with Torches. Uh, we are joined with again with Dr. Gavin Kerr. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing Thomas Aquinas and specifically uh, Aquinas's causal proofs for the existence of God. In particular, we're going to be focusing on the uh, the fourth way. Gavin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. You know, it, it's great to be back. I, I always en enjoy doing this. Um, I'm just back from Kung Fu. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's an evening time over here. We're just back from the Kung Fu class. So, um, yeah, it was just in quick sandwich, quick uh, can of monster and, you know, hitting the ground running. A great thing happened to me today. Somebody reached out to me um, who, who kind of, you know, has, uh, watched some of the podcasts and actually recorded a comedy sketch where he parodied me as if I delivered a paper. I heard was, that. Right, right. Yeah, I'm a, my wife was listening to it and she says, he's got you perfect. The accent is maybe not quite right, but the, uh, the whole rhythm and the way that you speak and talk, he's just got you perfect. And I yeah, was like, yeah. oh. so I, I really treasured that. I've listened to it several times, you know, and so it's just a really nice thing that happens. So yeah, I'm having a good day. And as I understand it, uh, earlier this month, well, not this month, but, but, but earlier in, uh, in June, you, if I remember correctly, you participated in uh, an MMA fight, but it, from the video that I saw, it kind of looked like a, a cage match almost. From <laughs> what, 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 how, how did that go over? Yeah, it was really good. You know, so it was a um, it was an amateur MMA fight in a cage. Um, it was on June nineteenth. Three rounds um, went the distance. It went the split decision, which my opponent got. So uh, two of the judges scored him, and one of the judges scored me. So. Um, I'll take that. I didn't get a knockout or anything, and I wasn't beaten up or nothing. So it was a it was a good match, and you know, got some good moves in, and you know, um, we just went at it in the cage. You know, hugged afterwards and everything, and went off and had drinks and dinner that night. I would do it again. Absolutely, I would do it again. I loved it. The preparation for it was hell, absolute hell. I had to drop so many kilos in weight. Didn't they have you on like on this strict regimented diet that you had to? To adhere to in order to, to lose all that weight or yeah I, ju I just had to drop the weight and i, I wasn't going to do a water cut the way i was on the day so i, w I wasn't going to cut the weight just like you know then you know that week or the night before so um in the five weeks leading up to it i was losing about you know one to two kilos per week i lost seven kilos all together and i was eating nothing but protein and high fats so it was basically on a keto diet um and it all just shaved off, absolutely. It, it all just shaved off, you know. Um, so it was, it was just, the body fat percentage was way, way down. And, yeah, so I went in there at 70 kilograms, um, weighed in. As soon as I weighed in, I was stuffing the face with, you know, energy bars, protein bars, packets of chicken, right. cans right. of Monster, everything. All the other fighters were doing the same. The fights weren't until half one, and we weighed in at 10, so we were all stuffing our faces. But great experience, absolute great experience, and um, yeah, I would do it again. Nice. Mm. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited for uh, us to have this this conversation because when we've talked about Aquinas in the past, it feels like we're always sort of laying backdrop or or uh, groundwork to what Aquinas is up to with maybe his uh, his metaphysics of essay or or the or the division of the sciences or the participation in metaphysics but now it mm. seems like we, we finally are digging into aquinas's uh famous five ways for god's mm. existence and yeah w what are the five ways uh in, in general what, what what type of argumentation is is used mm. to establish mm. god's existence for thomas yeah yeah okay great so uh the five ways they're probably the most famous of uh, Thomas's proofs for the existence of God. Um, there are a number of proofs scattered throughout his works. Um, I think uh, around about 40 or something like that uh, of proofs. And uh, and some of the work that I've been doing, uh, I argue that, uh, you know, all of these proofs are just manifestations of a, a single way to God and Aquinas. And, and that sort of issue is sort of going to come up here when we talk about the, the paralia per se distinction and how the, the paralia is reducible to the per se. Um, but the five ways, there is most famous proofs because, I mean, the Summa Theologiae is, you know, probably his most popular work, his most famous work. And um, they come in the second question of the Summa Theologiae because, um, as Thomas sees it, the subject matter of theology is God. OK, so that's the subject matter of theology. Um, so we need to have demonstration that God exists. OK, so we need to, you know, make sure 
um, that uh, we know that God exists before we can start, you know, thinking about him as our subject matter. The only problem is no science establishes the proof of um, its subject matter. It presupposes its subject matter and gets on with it. Um, so what Aquinas does is that, well, look, the subject matter of theology is God. Um, so we're going to need to prove God's existence. Well, theology can't do that. So what's the science propedeutic to theology? It's philosophy. OK, or the, the, the theology of the philosophers, as it's sometimes called, or first philosophy, which is a metaphysics. So it's in metaphysics um, that the uh, demonstration for God's existence is going to come about. And so what he does in the five ways is he deploys um, a number of uh, different ways or different approaches to the same metaphysical issues or the same metaphysical reasoning that will get us to God. And this is the, the paralia per se um, uh, reasoning that, that we're going to get to later in this chat. Uh, now, the five ways themselves, uh, they each springboard from a different starting point. We have the first and uh, more manifest way uh, that, uh, as Thomas calls it, which is the, the argument for motion. So that begins with a consideration of motion. Motion metaphysically considered as the movement from potency to act. The second way uh, considers causality. The third way considers um, possibility to be and not to be. Uh, the fourth way, which we're going to consider, uh, looks at the gradations found in things. And the fifth way uh, considers finality, the finality or the goal-directed behavior of things. And so they all springboard from these different starting points. And on the basis of a kind of metaphysical reasoning, which is common to all of them, they all arrive uh, at the existence of a primary cause uh, from which all things come, and this is God. Um, but before the five ways, before we get to the five ways, Thomas has to deal with a, an issue concerning the logic of demonstration or the philosophy of science, because um, uh, as listeners might know, uh, likely to know if they're listening to a podcast like this, um, the Summa Theology is divided up into questions, which are divided up into articles. Uh, and in question two of the Summa Theology, where Thomas is considering God's existence, it's in the third article that God's existence is considered. But before that, he asks, you know, whether or not God's existence is demonstrable. So it's in an article prior to that where the very demonstrability of God's existence is going to occur. And one of the objections uh, that Thomas considers, and it's a, a very potent objection, is that in any demonstration, the middle term of the demonstration tells us something about the essence of the subject of the demonstration. So a demonstration, a scientific demonstration, is the Aristotelian syllogism. It involves the Aristotelian syllogism. OK, so you have a major and a minor term and a middle term which connects up the major and the minor term so that uh, the conclusion will include the major of the the major and minor term connected, but the middle term will drop out. So uh, for for the, the listeners who are unaware of the Aristotelian syllogism, you've got two premises, major premise and a minor premise. The major premise is the major premise because it involves the major term, and the major term is the term which is the predicate of the conclusion. The minor premise is the minor premise because it has the minor term, which is the subject of the conclusion. A middle term is present in the, both those premises, but it drops out in the conclusion. So the middle term is what allows us to connect major and minor terms in the conclusion. So we take a cl the classic example, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So that's um, what's known as a first figure uh, syllogism in the mood of Barbara, for those who study logic. Um, and you see, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. The term common to both uh, premises is the term man or men. OK, that's the middle term. That's what mediates mortality in Socrates and allows us to draw the conclusion that Socrates is mortal. So if we can say that all men are mortal and that Socrates is one of those things, i.e. men, that the first premise tells us is mortal, then in the conclusion we can infer, well, then Socrates himself is mortal. So the middle term reveals something about the subject, the nature of the subject of demonstration. Socrates is a man. It tells us something about Socrates, which allows us to predicate something about Socrates. Um, but we have a problem. If we're going to have a demonstration of God's existence, what middle term can we make use of that can allow us to affirm that God exists? We don't, first of all, we, we can't know the essence of God. We might be able to apprehend, but we can't comprehend the essence of God. Secondly, God's very existence is, you know, the, the question under dispute. 
So we can't use any sort of middle term drawn from you know God's nature because we haven't even established that God exists yet. So how you know how can we do this? How, how can we have a demonstration that God exists? It would seem that this is impossible. Well, Tom, Thomas is on hand here um, because in the Aristotelian sort of uh, science of demonstration. Um, this is uh, Aristotle's uh, posterior analytics. The, the prior analytics, he goes through the, the nature of the syllogism, and the posterior analytics, he goes through the nature of demonstration. And in the posterior analytics, Aristotle distinguishes between two types of demonstration. There's what's called a propter quid demonstration and a quia demonstration. A propter quid demonstration doesn't just tell us the fact of the matter, it tells us why the fact is the fact. So in the Socrates syllogism that we just saw, um, we found out that the fact that Socrates is mortal, but we also know why Socrates is mortal, i.e. because he is a man. Okay, So we can infer so not only that Socrates is mortal, but we have a reason why he is mortal. So this is demonstration of the reason fact, and that's what a proper quid demonstration is. But there's another kind of demonstration, which is called a queer uh, demonstration. and um, a queer demonstration uh, typically reasons from effects, something known about the effect of the subject of demonstration to the subject of demonstration as the cause of that effect. Okay, so um, I don't have the argument in front of me, so I'll just try to download it in my mind right now. There's a famous uh, queer demonstration. There's a famous example which is used for queer and propter quid demonstrations um, concerning uh, the, planet the, the planets and their twinkling or lack of twinkling, and it goes something like this: Whatever um, does not twinkle is close. The planets do not twinkle, therefore the planets are close. Okay, so whatever does not twinkle is close. The planets do not twinkle, therefore the planets are close. Okay, so twinkling or lack of twinkling, that's the middle term, and that allows us to affirm something about the planets, i.e. that they are close. Okay, so that middle term is some effect or lack thereof of the planets, and it allows us to affirm that the planets are close. So it allows us to infer something about the planets. We don't know why they're close, okay, so it's not a demonstration of the reasoned fact, we don't know why they're close, we just know that they are close because they don't twinkle. We could turn that example into a proper quid demonstration by saying whatever is close does not twinkle, the planets are close, there, see we know something about the planets there, the planets are close, therefore the planets do not twinkle, okay, so there, that's a demonstration of the reasoned fact, why do the planets not twinkle? Well they don't twinkle because they're close. So that's a demonstration of the reason fact. But a demonstration simply of the fact is the previous one that we saw. That whatever uh, does not twinkle is close. The planets do not twinkle, therefore the planets are close. We just know that the planets are close, but we, we don't know why they're close. Okay, so all this is a long-winded way of highlighting that distinction between a queer and a propter quid demonstration. Both are demonstrations. Both are legitimate demonstrations. The propter quid demonstration just tells us why the fact is the way it is, whereas the quia demonstration just tells us the fact of the matter. But they're, bo they're both demonstrations. So when it comes to arguments for the existence of God then in Aquinas, Aquinas holds that we can't use a propter quid demonstration. That presupposes the existence of the subject of demonstration and that we know something about its essence. Can't do that with God. So we may have to make use of a queer demonstration, i.e. we have to reason from effect um, to cause. And this is typically what the five ways do. They reason from some known effect about creatures, um, some, so, some sort of an, an effect without which they would not be. And this is an important consideration. Okay, so each of the starting points of the five ways reasons from something about creatures um, without which they simply would not be the beings that they are. And so reasons through a sort of, you know, a metaphysical a process of metaphysical reasoning, um, reasons to some sort of primary cause without which creatures would not have that feature and thus without which they would not be. And so that's what Aquinas is doing in the five ways. That's the kind of demonstration that he's putting forth. And that's what I hold he's doing throughout all his demonstrations of God's existence, any of them um, that you find. There's more can be said on that, but the, the final point, uh, we don't have to pursue it here, but the final point to note there is that that characterizes Aquinas' um, sort of approach to God. 
that it's a causal approach to God. So God's, the consideration, the primary consideration of God in Aquinas' metaphysics is as a primary cause or first cause. So, and, and we're going to see when we consider the fourth way what he means by primary or first cause, but that characterizes his you know, metaphysics of God, that he's a first cause, not that he's a perfect being or a necessary being, but that he's primary cause. Perfection and necessity, they're derived. You, we, we know that after, we come to consider that after we consider God as a primary cause, but Thomas doesn't primarily consider God as a perfect being or a necessary being. Um, from the, the the viewpoint of our the human viewpoint, uh, our approach to God is as a primary cause, and then we infer everything else from that. Would it, it all be fair to compare that 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 division of syllogistic reasoning that that you just gave of propter quid and quia? Is it at all? Is it the same as how contemporary philosophers will talk about a priori, a posteriori? I, I've heard. I think the Black Fire, Black Friars Summa translates it like that, but I've heard. Uh, uh, some Thomas t take issue with, with conflating the two characters. Yeah, yeah. So, so this bothers me because you know I I typically give my students um, essays on the difference between quia and propter quid <laughs> demonstrations, and because I mean the students aren't reading Latin, um, so and they typically go. I mean the, the that edition, the the Dominican Fathers edition, is the standard uh, English translation and it translates quia and propter quid as a posteriori and, uh, a priori. And that really bothers me because a priori, I mean, what, what does a priori and a posteriori mean in modern and contemporary philosophy? Well, what's a posteriori is derived from the senses and what's a priori, it comes from the mind. Um, so an a priori demonstration of God's existence is one that begins from, you know, concepts or, or, or mental content, contents and reasons to God's existence and uh, an a posteriori demonstration um, is based on perceptual experience. Quia and propter quid demonstrations um, can be based on sense experience or perceptual experience, both of them. Um, so in contemporary terms, both quia and propter quid demonstrations would be taken to be a posteriori. So the, the, the Socrates syllogism is a propter quid demonstration, but it's based on sense experience. Um, the non-twinkling of the stars, because they're close, that's a propter quid demonstration, but again, based on sense experience. And so it would be classed as a posteriori in contemporary philosophy. So I don't think you can neatly categorize quia and propter quid as a posteriori and a priori the way the uh, Dominican translation um, of the Summa does it. Gotcha. Mm. All right, then. Well, I figured that maybe then we could discuss the four way, the fourth way itself. What is Aquinas's fourth way? Um, as I understand it, it's, it's one of the more difficult to understand of, of the five ways. Typically, there, there, there's, there's much praise for the first three ways, the argument for motion, mm. efficient causality, and uh, uh, the necessary and, and, and the possible. But, but, with, but with this one, it's a bit more difficult because it seems like Aquinas is sort of just breezing through these uh, premises as if almost as if they're self-evident. Mm, yeah, yeah. So th this is import important. Important. Uh, there's an uh, important sort of you know propedeutic here, uh, such that um, you can't understand any of Aquinas's proofs of God unless you understand the metaphysics that he deploys in those proofs. So and, and that goes for all of the five ways. And it more or less just goes for, you know, anything that Aquinas says or that any medieval philosopher really says is that you can't get where they're coming from unless you understand their metaphysics. Um, the fourth way is uh, deploying uh, metaphysical issues and metaphysical reasoning that Aquinas defends explicitly elsewhere. Uh, and it's being deployed in the fourth way as self-evident. And now it's understandable that Thomas does that. The, the Summa Theologiae is... A, uh, it's a manual in theology for beginners in theology, i.e. those who are starting uh, beginning in theology, i.e. at a higher sort of postgraduate level at the University of Paris. So they've been through the arts program, they know their philosophy, um, they know the sort of the, the metaphysics that Thomas is alluding to, uh, and so he's just presupposing that and moving on, much in the same way that, you know, if, say, I taught an advanced level logic class, I could just presuppose that, you know, the students were familiar with, you know, the propositional, the predicate calculus, uh, maybe some modal operators, stuff like that. Um, 
So that's what Thomas is doing in the fourth way. And so to understand it, you, you really need to understand the metaphysics which buttresses it. So maybe if, if we just go through the actual text of the fourth way and then we'll start considering each of the different moves that he makes in it. How does that sound? That that makes sense. Um, would mm -hmm. you like me to read it out? Or? I don't know. I, I can read it out and then we okay. can, you know, you you can sort of zone in on what we want to focus on. Um, but that sounds good. I mean, each of the five ways is just, you know, basic paragraph and length. It's only about, each of them are only about 10 lines each. Uh, and so the fourth way, it goes as follows, and it's taken uh, from the gradation, which is found in things. And so he begins by saying that there's found in things something more or less good, true, noble, and the like. Um, so there's more or less goodness, truth, and nobility, and the like in things. And then he goes on to say that, the more uh, and the less are said of diverse things according as they diversely approach what is such maximally, just as the hotter is that which approaches what is maximally hot. There's something then that is most true, best and most noble and consequently maximally in being um, for what are maximally true are maximally beings, as I said in the second book of the metaphysics. So that's uh, referring back to Aristotle. That's, you know, what's maximally true is maximally being. It's the convertibility of being and truth. Now, what is maximally such in a given genus is the cause of all the members of that genus, as fire, which is maximally hot, is the cause of all hot things. Therefore, there is something which is the cause of all beings of essay and goodness and of every other perfection, and this we call God. So just a quick breakdown of the argument. There's two stages here. There's the first stage, which is probably the, the more interesting, the more controversial one. Uh, and that's what I call, um, in paper I wrote on this in the ACPQ, I call that the maxime stage or the maximal stage. And that's where Thomas reasons from the gradations of goodness, truth, nobility and the like found in things to some sort of maximal, to something that is maximal, um, which is the measure of that things, uh, of those things. Uh, and, that, and that's where the conclusion of that is where Thomas says there's something that is most true and best and most noble and consequently maximally in being. Notice what he says there something most true, best and most noble, and consequently maximally in being, um, for what are maximally true max are maximally beings, set in the second book of the metaphysics. So that's the maximum stage, and it finishes there. Then uh, the second stage is where he shows that everything is caused by what is maximal in being, and that's where Thomas reasons that what is maximally such in a given genus is the cause of all the members of that genus as far that is maximally hot is the cause of all hot things. That being the case, given that we know that there's something maximal in being uh, and that what is maximal in any given genus is the cause of all else in that genus, then we know that this that is maximal in being is the cause of anything, of any being, and that's what God is. God is the cause of all beings. Everything depends on God. So that that's the basic breakdown of the argument. But Obviously, as we say, there's um, a lot of sort of metaphysical buttressing of that. He's calling on, you know, some very deep teachings in metaphysics. So, um, Hunter, I'm happy enough, you know, to just bounce in wherever you would like us to take that, right. whatever reasoning you'd like us to consider. Right. I, as I understand it, this isn't the only version of a participation uh, argument that Aquinas gives in his works. As I understand it, there's a very similar argument that Aquinas gives in his lecture on, on St. John's Gospel. And there he says, this is the way of the Platonists. Yeah. Uh, there's something that whatever exists by participation is reduced to what is something by per se through through its essence, mm. its first and highest. Um, mm. w w would you say that that what's going on in, in, in this proof is mm. Aquinas's metaphysics of participation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you, you're right to point out uh, you got the sentences commentary, you've got the Contra Gentiles. So there's the, the other five ways in the Contra Gentiles, book one, chapter 13. And then, as you, as you point out, the, um, the lectures on St. John's Gospel. I think it's in the prologue um, to the St. John's Gospel where he goes through the different proofs of God and he talks about the one from the Platonists. And it, it, it more or less the same argument, except that he mentions the Platonists and he mentions uh, participation and participation in essay, uh, but it's more or less uh, the same argument. And it was actually reading that argument that spurred me on to uh, considering the fourth way and writing um, uh, my own article on the fourth way and, and connecting it up with this general way to God that I sort of see emerging 
and Aquinas' thought. So would you maybe like me to sort of go through how the, the metaphysics of essay slots in here into the fourth way? Sure, that would be appreciated. Mm. Yeah. Well, so on Aquinas' metaphysics of essay, um, things that exist exist through participation in essay and their active existence because um, things are composites of essence and existence. And, and you know, this is something that sort of I've been through and is very well known in Aquinas' thought. Um, but they're, they're, they're composites of essence and existence such that the act of existence actuates the essence, but the essence doesn't exist of itself. The essence would not be without its act of existence. So it, in order to be, it participates in that act of existence. So it doesn't possess existence per se. It possesses existence per allude through another. Okay, so things in which essence and existence are distinct, they possess existence through another. And then um, in uh, another very famous um, proof of God's existence in Aquinas, one that I've looked at, uh, which is the one from the De Ante Ad Essentia, uh, Thomas reasons that what is per allude through another is reduced to what is per se uh, in the order of dependency. This is a very platonic move. Because uh, remember, so Plato um, as, as sort of classically understood reasons that, you know, uh, creatures, things exist uh, by way of participation in some form, such that if the form didn't exist, the creatures who participate in that form wouldn't exist. And this is, you know, so the, the, the sort of the best sort of characterization of this is given in the myth of the cave in the Republic, um, whereby the forms are like the objects outside of the cave and creatures are like the shadows which the objects uh, cast on the wall at the back of the cave. So all things on the platonic account are like shadowy participations of the form, such that were there not a form, there wouldn't be anything for things to be shadows of. And Thomas is more or less employing the same sort of reasoning here, that all things that merely have existence but are not identical to their existence are shadowy manifestations of what is pure existence itself, of what exists per se and not per allude. Um, now, there's very uh, sophisticated causal reasoning that he uses there uh, based on the division between per se and per accidents, causal series. In a per se causal series, just, just very briefly, in a per se causal series, the members of uh, that causal series have the causality of the series per allude through another. They don't have it per se. They don't have it essentially. So the example that always comes up is the mental agent moves his hand to move the stick to move the stone. The hand, the stick, and the stone, they don't have motion. That's the causality of the series. They don't have that essentially. They have it through another. And if there were no other, okay, in which they could participate to have that causality, they would simply be without the causality in question. There would be no causal series in question. The other through which the hand, stick, and stone have that their causality, their motion, is the mental agent. Now, the mental agent has that causality per se, per se of himself, the mental agent is able to move his hand, stick in the stone. He doesn't depend on any other in order to do that. Um, and that's, that's what a primary cause is. A primary cause is something which has causality per se and not through another. So Aquinas' general way to God then is to reason for some characteristics that creatures per se possess per allude uh, and to arrive at some per se cause of that. And in the, in the De Ante argument, um, the feature that they possess per allude is um, the feature of existence. Now here in the fourth way, Thomas begins um, with uh, the gradation of goodness, truth, and nobility in such like and things. Okay, uh, so he begins by considering that. That's an obvious feature of things. Things are more or less good, true, and noble, and such like. Uh, and then he goes on to infer that the more and the less are said of diverse things according as they diversely approach what is thus maximally, just as the hotter is that which approaches what is maximally hot. Okay, so that's called the approximating relation. And that's always, you know, sort of causes a bit of difficulty amongst interpreters of this argument. Because when we read the first premise of that argument, we see good, truth, nobility, and we think, oh, well, he, he must be referring to the transcendentals there, because later on in the argument, he talks about the convertibility of truth with being um, from the second book of the metaphysics. So Thomas must be concerned with the transcendentals, the, the good and the true. So that must be, you know, what he's on about. So that's how we have to understand this argument. He's concerned with the transcendentals and he's arguing that given the transcendentals and things, you know, they're convertible with being and in some way we arrive at God at the end of it. 
But that gives us trouble with how to understand the approximating relation. That's one issue, interpreting uh, the consideration in terms of the transcendentals. But there's also the other issue as well. And this is kind of where I had sort of my bit of insight. And I'll not say it was a breakthrough because Cornelio Fabro um, and Gary Goulagrange figured this out, you know, well before me. Mm-hmm. In the first premise, Thomas certainly does mention two of the transcendentals, the true and the good. OK, no argument there. The, the true and the good appear in every list of the transcendentals that you will find um, in this, uh, when Aquinas treats of them. The noble, nobility, doesn't appear. OK, right. so nobility just does not appear in any of the lists of the transcendentals. You know, when Thomas speaks ex cathedra on the transcendentals. And I will also point out, and I will probably get attacked for this. And, you know, so I'm just going to say that the beauty doesn't appear in the, in the list of the transcendentals either. But here... He mentions nobility. Nobility just does not appear in the list of the transcendentals. And this led me to thinking, nobility is doesn't appear in the lists of the transcendentals, uh, but the, the true and the good appear here along with nobility. It may not be that what Thomas is concerned with is the transcendentals. It may be something else. So mm. I went there, how do we read of, you know, the authors who had written about this? Cornelio Fabro thought this argument was the central, the the pinnacle argument for God and Aquinas' thought. So I went and read Cornelio Fabro, and I went and read, read Garigou Lagrange, and they pointed out that um, whenever Thomas uses the term nobility, nobilitas, mm. um, he uses it to mean actuality or perfection. So he uses it to mean actuality and perfection. And um, Fabro, Garigou Lagrange, and even Van Steenbergen, um, they all point this out. They didn't have access to the index Thomisticus, you know, the, the the search engine where you can search for a term throughout all, uh, the 10 million words that Aquinas wrote. You right. can search, you know, how, how much it appears. They didn't have access to that. Um, so they just, you know, kind of, you know, labeled, you know, a few other discussions. I went and I typed in the term nobilitas into the index Thomisticus and, you know, restricted it just, you know, sort of to the major works of Aquinas and not the spurious ones. And um, in all the relevant discussions, you know, where he just talks about nobilitas as a reality that things have, he's talking about perfection. He's talking about actuality. And as memory serves me, he, he even relates it to essay at one point. Okay. okay. So just run that through, you know, given what we just sort of, you know, were thinking about per se ordered series that, you know, the members of the series, they don't have the causal actuality of the series per se. They have it per allure. So just bear that in mind. And then the fact that nobilitas for Aquinas is being used interchangeably with perfection, with actuality. And also bear in mind that what is essay for Aquinas? We have essay as the act of all acts, the perfection of all perfections. Uh, we have nobility being used in, in Aquinas's wider thought with actuality, with perfection. Um, we have essay as the act of all acts, the perfection of all perfections. And so the light bulb went off in my head that, you know, maybe when a Thomas talks about things being more or less good, more or less true, more or less noble and such like, he's talking about things having more or less actuality, mm-hmm. more or less of reality to them, more or less of a kind of actuality an actuality that they participate in, that they don't have that actuality to the fullest extent. And that's the metaphysics of participation in Aquinas, that what participates in a given perfection only has that perfection to a limited degree, doesn't have the full universality of that perfection. So here we are at the beginning of the fourth fourth way with the approximating relation uh, affirmed that, you know, we have something which is more or less this, that and the other because it is it has more or less of actuality and so only participates in its actuality. And that's how we understand the examples that he uses. So he says that just as the hotter is that which approaches what is maximally hot. So what is it to, you know, be more or less hot? It's not to possess heat per se. It's not to possess the actuality of heat per se, but it's merely to participate in heat. So you are more or less hot depending on the degree, your degree of participation in the heat of the sun. How close you are to the sun, how you know how hot the sun is that day, you know, the tilt right. of the earth, the cloud coverage, 
how close you are to a radiator, that sort of thing. Anything which is not per se hot is more or less hot because it only has heat per aliud, per participationum, through another. Okay? So that gets us then to affirming that there must be something maximal. Because if things only have the actuality per aliud through another, like in the per se ordered series, if there isn't another in which they participate for that actuality, you would have no actuality in which to participate. There just wouldn't be any actuality in the series. So if things only have actuality in a participated sense, if you don't have something in which they participate, they couldn't even have it in that participated sense. So the more and the less good, true and noble as signifying being more and less actual points to something which is actual in itself in which they participate. And this, of course, is what's going to be maximally such. It's going to be maximal in actuality. And if it's maximal in actuality, it's most true, it's best, it's most noble. And consequently, and Thomas says this, it's maximally in being. It's ma Why would he say it's maximally in being if, it's, if he's meaning, you know, it's maximally actual? Because essay is the act of all acts, the perfection of all perfections. Um, I, think, I might, might have got a bit carried away there, you know, getting into the argument, but I hope that made sense to you. No, I, I think it very much did. And if I, if I remember from my studies of Aquinas' participation metaphysics, he gives a threefold division of participation. And, and, and with respect to this argument, he's concerned with causal participation. So mm. we're talking about yeah. things receiving in a particular limited manner what belongs to another unlimited mm. universally, and, and, then, and that, that would be God. So, so that's yeah. what's going on in if I understand correctly, the, the the fourth way, where we're speaking of causal participation reduced to what is per se. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if you want, we can get into the different kinds of participation, but yeah, uh, Thomas, think, you know, sorry, I, I, go on, yeah. I, I, I think we, we, we did that uh, in, in our episode on uh, on participation. I'll, I'll link it in, in, in the, in the yeah. description. I thought that was a very good, good, good episode, uh, by, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Yes. Go on. I I did want to ask though, with respect to um the second and and third premises, Aquinas employs uh the language of the more and the less as as and this is to be understood as gradational rather than mm -hmm. like quantitative measurements. Like he, he's, mm -hmm. he's he's we we're not talking about like more or less with respect to to quantity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it's more or less with regard to participation, with regard to uh, possessing um, the reality um, to to a certain degree. So you can you can present you can have heat to literally degrees of heat. Um, uh, you you can have more or less of it because you have the the the, the reality um, to a certain degree. You participate in the reality to a certain degree, but it's not taken to be uh, such as you know quantitative. Uh, more or less, and quantity can be more or less, but there's other um, ways, things w which can be more or less given uh, the reality in question. I see. Mm -hmm. And then if I, if I can also ask with respect to the second premise, uh, when Aquinas is talking about, you know, just as something that is hotter approaches what is maximally hot, mm. uh, you know, so, 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 such as fire, mm. um, if I understand correctly, Aquinas is using this as an illustration as an illustration, well, would that be correct? Mm -hmm. Because whenever he talks about participation in other contexts, he mm -hmm. uses the example of like absolute whiteness or absolute mm -hmm. heat, and then heat that's yeah. received into this and that uh, subject. Yeah, yeah. It's either Van Steenbergen or Fabro who point this out, um, that uh, usually when Thomas talks about participation and something being absolute, it's usually the far example or, you know, the separated color um, example. And um, what he means there is that um, fire is such that it heats per se, it heats of itself. So whereas we are hot because we participate in a heat from some source, fire doesn't participate in some source of heat. It is the source of heat. So that's what makes it maximally hot. Not that it, you know, reaches some sort of Kelvin temperature or something like that. It's maximally hot because it, it's, it is of the nature of fire to heat. Uh, and so mutatis mutandi, something is maximally a, a being 
because um, it's of its nature to be. It exists essentially. So it, again, it's deploying the participation medics here, metaphysics here, and it's just uh, one more example of it. And you know, for those who understand that participation metaphysics, one, one can see how the example slots in there are things which aren't maximally hot, merely participate in the reality of heat, whereas fire doesn't participate in the reality of heat. That's what originates um, the reality of heat. You know, so heat heating is something that fire does per se. So, so far we've, we've Aquinas has established, okay, that there are things in, in existence that are more or less good, true, and noble, and we, we've connected nobility with, with perfection and specifically the, the the perfection of essay or or, or the, the act mm -hmm. of all acts and perfection of all perfections and we've talked mm -hmm. about how more or less are set of things insofar as they approach what is maximal mm -hmm. and, and then we, we've talked about okay if there if there is something then that is most true and and, and best uh and maximal in all being it would be the cause of all thing of everything else that participates in in these in these perfections right yeah yeah, that that that's the second part of the argument. Then that's the causal stage, where where he argues, you know, whatever is maximal or per se in a given genus is the cause of all the members, i.e., the cause of all the participates in the reality of that genus. Um, and then that that gets him to his conclusion then that you know there's a a primary cause for the being of all things because we we've established here that there's some maximal being which has being per se. So this maximal being is the cause of the being of all else. Anything which participates in being um, is caused to do so uh, by this primary being which has uh, being or essay or actuality per se, and that's what we call God. I, I did. I would want to ask about uh, mm. particip participation with respect to causality. Mm. Why does Aquinas, I think we alluded to this in, in the episode we did on uh, participation, but, but but I'm still having a hard time understanding why Aquinas connects participation with causality, or at least a specific yeah. type of participation. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So to participate is to possess in a limited manner what is in itself universal, okay? So it's to, it's to possess in a limited manner what is in itself universal. And, you know, so as, as we pointed out, uh, I'm pretty sure we pointed out in the participation episode that uh, Aquinas, you know, he, he has this discussion in the commentary on the De bus, and, you know, he mm. gives an almost etymological description of participation that uh, partem capere literally means to take a part, to possess partially. So if to participate in something is to possess in a partial manner what is in itself universal, an effect, an effect will participate in its cause that way, so long as the cause is the per se source of whatever it is, so the, the per se source of motion, the per se source of heat, um, or whatever. Because if something um, is, let's say, a per se source of heat, what it does is it originates heat. Okay, it's the cause of the reality of heat. It doesn't just pass it on, it's the cause of the reality of heat. So in that per se source of heat, heat is present universally such that that's what that source does, that's what it brings about. So anything which is heated by that participates in the heat that the source gives. And precisely because it participates in the heat that the source gives, it possesses heat in a limited uh, manner, in a participated uh, manner. So Thomas connects up participation with causality, uh, that type of participation uh, with causality, precisely because an effect possesses the reality of its cause in a limited manner. That's why it's an effect. If it mm -hmm. had the reality of the cause in an unlimited, in a universal or a per se manner, it wouldn't be an effect. It itself would be a cause, an originator of the reality. But because the effect is not the originator of the reality, um, it only, you know, it derives the reality from something and is dependent on that thing for the reality. It only possesses the the real the causal reality in question in a limited uh, and thus participated manner. So that's why Thomas runs participation together with causality. I see. Then and, and so that allows him to go from the first stage to to the second stage where he introduces yeah. uh, causality. Because as I understand it, that's kind of a, a source of confusion for some commentators because it sounds mm. like in the first stage he's talking about perhaps an exemplar causality but then in the second mm. stage it sounds like he's talking about uh mm. efficient causality yeah yeah whereas as i just see it he's just talking about causality in general you know mm. causality and dependency linked up with participation 
Um, so um, there, there was a bit of a fashion, you know, for ultra fine distinctions, you know, within neoscholasticism, you know, is this, a, you know, example or causality of, you know, the stage one mode two stroke three variety or some other, you know, right. uh, you know, they, they really went hair splitting, you know, on the categorization here. You don't see that in Thomas. Uh, you don't see that, you know, too much in medieval Aristotelians. You see it an awful lot in the likes of Garigou Lagrange and the other neo-scholastics. Um, what I think is just going on throughout is a, a concern for causality uh, and dependency um, on cause, uh, for causality, which is the, the paraliot uh, per se distinction. So the move to from the maximal stage to the um, the causality stage doesn't really sort of concern me because I see uh, dependency and participation as being present throughout. And so when, when we read it as an argument which has, you know, this idea of participation per alliot to the per se um, at its heart, then that, that, that final stage of the argumentation makes a lot, of, a lot of sense because what we've seen is that we have some per se source of actuality uh, in which things which have actuality participate Given that they are participants, they're dependent uh, for the reality that they derive from um, the per se source of that reality, which is therefore the originator of that reality. And as the originator of that reality, it's the cause of that reality. Would it all be fair then to say that causal, metaphys causal metaphysics are sort of implicit in, in the first stage, but they're made explicit in, in the second stage? or? When he's talking about more or less set of diverse things according as they approach what is maximally, if he's talking about the metaphysics of participation, he's implicitly talking about efficient causality, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. If he's talking about the metaphysics of participation, he is talking about causality there. Yeah. Mm. And then with respect to the fourth uh, sort of premise that mm. what is maximally such in a genus is the cause of the members of the genus and then he says, you know, fire is is his cause of all hot things. This is kind of a a difficult sentence because it seems to suggest then that that being is mm. is a genus. But of course, yeah. for Aquinas and really all the scholastics following mm. Aristotle, being isn't in in a genus. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. is he just saying this sort of hyperbolically or metaphorically, or what, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, that that was an inter. That that was an interesting sentence to deal with when I wrote uh, the article in the ACPQ. Um, and you're right. So he's showing that there's something maximal in being. And he says that, you know, well, look, if you got something maximal in a genus, it's the cause of the members of that genus. And so there's a cause for, uh, you know, all beings. He seems to be saying then that, you know, we have something maximal in being. Uh, we've got members of this genus of being. And it's the cause of all these members of this genus. And we're, we're all like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, right back to Aristotle, being can't be a genus. Why? Because the way in which we uh, specify or determine a genus is through some differentiating feature, which is outside of that genus. But there's nothing outside of being which can differentiate it. So being can't be a genus. Being isn't a univocal um, reality. Um, which is specified like a genus being is an analogical reality, which is, you know, differs in the different, you know, it's different manifestations. Um, so you're absolutely right. You know, is Thomas saying being is a genus here? And thanks be to God, I found a text. Uh, I, I don't have it here in front of me, but it's in the ACPQ article. I referenced this text that mm. Thomas actually says in um, uh, the, his commentary on the metaphysics, metaphysics, and I think it's addressing the same issue that, you know, Aristotle seeming to suggest that being is a genus. Um, Thomas says something along the lines of, look, you know, we can talk about a genus in a very technical sense, i.e., you know, a genus which is specified by a differentiating, um, you know, characteristic, or we can talk about, or we can use the term genus in uh, a looser sort of sense to talk about a particular grouping with a particular kind of, you know, uh, understanding of their nature uh, mm -hmm. before us. And that's what we're doing here when we talk about beings. We're talking about a particular grouping which are dependent uh, for their being. That's what we're doing here. We're talking generically or generally. I think Thomas uses the term in the text that I quote. Um, we're simply, you, we can use the term genus just to talk about something generally, but not to mean, you know, the technical sense of a genus. 
you know, a, a logical genus is a logical category subject to specification and differentiation. And so given that we do have precedent in Thomas's writing for using the term genus in a looser sense, just to mean general, you know, a, a general or generic grouping of things, um, we, we needn't interpret, we needn't interpret him here as taking being to be a genus, nor need we interpret him here as being inconsistent with his previous uses of the term genus, because in his commentary on the metaphysics, he specifically defends, you know, the right to use that term in a looser sense. So he's, he's fully consistent with himself elsewhere, and he's not taken being to be a genus here. Sure. All right, then. And then if I can maybe ask, we, we've established, if, if, if this argument establishes that there is something through itself that is good, that that, that is true, that is noble, or, or, or it, it's, it's unlimited in its perfection, but why does Aquinas think then that this we all call God? And, and I, I've been particularly wondering this with respect to the predications of the transcendentals. Okay, goodness, mm. truth, unity, being like aliquid, whatever. Those are all going to apply to God simply because he is pure essay itself. But what about the other traditional predications that are not uh, transcendentals, like the intellect mm. or will or wisdom? Mm. Mm -hmm. Aquinas, Aquinas has, has other arguments, though, for, 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 to establish those, though. Yeah. So, um, what, what's at stake here in the fourth way? And I, I, as I um, understand all the ways, what, what's at stake in each of them is actuality. Okay? That things are actual. And each of the starting points of the ways uh, focuses in on some uh, kind of actuality, such that if creatures didn't have it, they simply wouldn't have actuality. Uh, and the fourth way is doing the same. It's zoning in on the actuality that things have, um, uh, points towards something, point, m makes the point that uh, creatures have this actuality through another. They don't have it essentially, they have a prelude. And so it reasons to some per se source of that actuality. So the per se source of that actuality is per se actual. It's actual through itself. And so everything derives its actuality from this source. So as the concluding line of the first way or the fourth way goes, there is something which is the cause for all beings of essay and goodness and every other perfection. So this is the cause of all beings of essay. It's the cause of all other things for their essay and so for their goodness and so for every other perfection. In other words, it's the cause of the actuality of all other things. So mm. nothing would be actual were it not for this. And that's what God is. That's what a creator is. That's what a primary cause of all things is. It is something without which nothing would be. And that's, you know, basic for our understanding of God. Um, mm. if, if, if we didn't call this God, what else would we call it? Right. Um, th this, this is what deity is. Um, ph philosophically understood, it is the primary cause of all things. And then having established that, um, Aquinas, you know, in his, you know, primary cause approach um, to God, not a perfect being approach, not a necessary being approach, a primary cause approach. We've established a primary cause for all things without which nothing would be. Then we go on to consider its nature. What is it like to be this primary cause? And once we do that, we can go on to affirm simplicity, perfection, goodness, infinity, eternity, immutability, and all the rest. Right. It's it's important to remember that for Aquinas, the the five ways and really all of his arguments, they're they're metaphysical demonstrations. He's interested in you know what what is the ground of of all being, whether or not yeah. they're con contingent or necessary or or, yeah. or what have you. Yeah, he's not interested in in giving a, a demonstration from you know per se nota like you might you might find in Anselm, and and and, mm -hmm. and he's not really interested in even the, with the third way. It's not so much a contingency argument mm. so much as what's he's concerned about what's necessary and and and, and what's possible and he reasons it back back to god yeah yeah that's right so uh thomas all thomas's proofs of god are proofs taken from metaphysics they have to be because mm. if we're and this swings back to the queer demonstration and the middle term the middle term of a demonstration for god has to be um some sort of an effect which will get us to a primary cause of all that is. So the effect has to pertain to the being of things without which nothing would be. 
Okay, so things have being, otherwise there are nothing. So whatever effect it is under consideration has to pertain to the very being of things, and then we arrive at a primary cause for that being. If it's any other sort of middle term, if it's a middle term drawn from physics, well, what's the subject matter of physics? It's mobile being. Mm -hmm. It's not the very being of things, it's the mobility of a thing's being. That's not going to get us to a primary cause of all that is. That's only going to get us to a primary source of the mobility of things. So right. we're not going to get to, you know, we're, we're not going to get to a cause, say, of things which are immobile, uh, creatures which are immobile in that account. We'll, we'll only get to, you know, a cause of, you know, uh, the mobile things. So right. um, and, uh, Aquinas doesn't just say that, um, you know, it's in metaphysics where we establish God's existence, and that's in the, his commentary on the De Trinitate. Um, right. he, he has a principled reason for making that affirmation, which is to do with the nature of a queer demonstration. Just to repeat that the middle term has to be some sort of, sort of an effect which will permit us to reason to a primary cause of all that is. So the effect then has to pertain to, uh, it has to be something about creatures some feature of creatures without which there would be nothing. So it pertains to the being of creatures and not to their mobility or their design or their, you know, intelligent design or anything else like that. Right. Um, it, it has to be to their very being. So it has to be a metaphysical proof for God's existence. I see. All right. Well, I think we've we, we've been able to cover everything that that I've wanted to cover with respect to the uh, the fourth way. I think it's definitely my my favorite. But personally, for me, it's my favorite out of all the the five proofs. But mm. if if I can maybe ask, it seems like for in order to properly understand or appreciate the fourth way, really all of Aquinas's arguments is that it seems that you have to understand Aquinas's metaphysical commitments before. Mm embarking on this and and, and mm. just in this episode alone we've we've referenced aquinas's participation metaphysics the metaphysics of essay his understanding of like the, the division of the sciences it, it really seems that, that that before you dive into the arguments you have to look at aquinas's sort of broader metaphysical commitments yeah yeah that, that that's absolutely right and that highlights something of the mindset of aquinas and the other medi medieval authors here such that um, they're engaged on what could be called a scientific enterprise, okay? Mm. Um, they, they're considering demonstrations about the nature of being, about the nature of mobile being, or w w whatever the science that they're embarking on, and they want to give the full picture of things. So that when Aquinas comes to a demonstration of God's existence, he's not just sitting thinking, right, you know what, um, I, I think I'll write a new article and, you know, uh, it'll be about the existence of God, whereas tomorrow we'll write an article about the immortality of the soul, and after that I'll do one on whatever, you know, the way modern academics do. Right, um, right. He's writing a summa. He's writing an entire, he, he's giving an entire picture of reality as he sees it. So he has to move from point to point to point in a scientifically progressive manner. And part of doing that leads him to a, a consideration of whether or not God exists. So God's existence doesn't just come in as an interesting, you know, argument. Thomas thought he, he he would put down while he was sitting at his desk, you know, to, right. you know, to, to get into a publication, you know, to up a CV. He's actually doing philosophy. He's doing metaphysics and trying to, you know, depict the, the nature of reality, which is why when you get to, to the, the, the proofs of God's existence in Aquinas, especially in the um, independent, you know, philosophical texts, they always come later. You know, they, they, they always come after a lot of groundwork. The Dante Ed Essentia is a classic in that respect. It's not until chapter four, and it's not, and it's only in the context of demonstrating the distinction between essence and existence, dealing with universal hylomorphism, that the argument for God's existence comes in um, almost like an afterthought. But it's, it's in order to be complete that, you know, the arguments for God's existence uh, come in. It, it, it fills out the picture as it were. Now, the reason why they come in at the beginning of the, the theological um, summa, the Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologiae, is that theology begins with God. So we need some sort of a proof for that starting point, which is drawn from metaphysics, and then theology takes over and, you know, get, goes on its merry way. But in um, a philosophical work, uh, the proof for God's existence comes uh, quite late in the day, because that's that's kind of what, where we're aiming at, that, that that's where the goal is. Um, and given that outlook, then 
you can't understand um, Aquinas's proofs for God's existence independently of their philosophical buttressing. And that's almost tautologous. If you're going to have a philosophical proof for God's existence, you, you, you have to understand the, the philosophical buttressing that goes behind it. Um, uh, and unfortunately, you know, and a, lot, a lot of the mindset in uh, the contemporary sort of, you know, literature on the philosophy of religion and proofs for the existence of God, they just want a sort of a straight up proof that you can enter into, you know, with a kind of an air of neutrality um, uh, of uh, with regard to metaphysical commitments. But why should we be neutral when it comes to metaphysical commitments when we enter proofs for the existence of God, when we're not neutral, say, over logical commitments? We're mm. committed to, you know, the nature of logic, you know, bivalence, uh, uh, demonstration, the nature of demonstration. We, we have all sorts of commitments there, and, you know, sometimes they're made explicit. Which logical commitments, which epistemic commitments that we're using sometimes, you know, or some of the intelligent design argumentation, you know, uh, the, the probability reasoning that we're using. We're not neutral with regard to those philosophical commitments. So why is it assumed that we have to be neutral towards metaphysical uh, commitments when we enter proofs for God's existence? The reality is that, you know, these proofs for God's existence make moves uh, within metaphysics and presuppose a metaphysics. And so they can't be understood or evaluated without understanding and evaluating uh, those uh, metaphysical commitments. And so any attempt to read Aquinas in particular um, without attempting to understand his metaphysics um, will always be a straw man, will always end up mm -hmm. in a straw man argument. And even if it gets Aquinas right, it'll only get him right accidentally. Um, unless it, it's on, unless that engagement has engaged with his uh, actual metaphysical reasoning. Right, and it seems that typically with respect to attacks or critiques of the five ways, they, mm. they sort of start out, as you said, you know, that, that they're uh, metaphysically neutral uh, assumptions, but, but, but really all of Aquinas' metaphysics come to bear in, mm. in his five ways. And if, if a person were to try to critique the five ways, it's probably a better idea to critique his metaphysics and his metaphysical reasoning. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in, in all of the five ways, you, you have that, you, you, well, you have the per se ordered series in all of them. In the fourth way here, he actually says there's a cause of the essay of things. I mean, anybody who knows anything about, you know, Aquinas these days, uh, knows that, you know, when you see Aquinas use the term essay, you know, as an attribute, of as a feature of things, already there is a whole, you know, raft of metaphysical, you know, presuppositions he has there because that's just, you know, that's unique to him. So he mentions essay, you know, he uses the per se ordered series approach. He talks about act and potency in the first way, causality in the second way. And I will note um, that elsewhere Thomas says that it um, it pertains to, you know, the the physician, so somebody who does physics, to consider uh, individual causes, but it pertains to the metaphysician to consider the nature of causality itself. Um, you see him talk about possibility and necessity, uh, possibility to be and not to be in the third way, and he talks about a finality um, in the fifth way. All these are metaphysical realities, so they should just set our alarm bells ringing and send us off, you know, looking at Thomas's independent treatment of those before we... Uh, uh, you know, consider what he has to say in each of the ways. Right, that makes sense. Uh, well, and then, and then to uh, the end of further studying the five ways, do you have any uh, recommendations for someone who'd want to study either the fourth way or the five ways in general? I know you talked about the, the article for the uh, the ACPQ article that, that mm. you published recently. Uh, mm. I think that that would be a good, good place to start because I, I thought that was a very accessible article. Yeah, I, I enjoyed writing that article, and um, when I saw John Canassis uh, a few months ago, you know, he 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 actually congratulated on me, uh, congratulated me on it, and it, it was he that pointed out to, to me that you know, Gavin, it never actually occurred to me that you know Thomas actually mentions essay in the fourth way, and um, so yeah, I mean, for the fourth way, I think my article is probably the most recent in the literature because it it's just it just came out a few months back. Um, I think probably the best treatment of the five ways, um, which kind of sort of, you know, brings in the metaphysical side of things, is John Whipple's treatment in the metaphysical thought of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, in Whipple, you get a top class historian of philosophy who can also do philosophy himself. And so he, that 
his treatment of the five ways comes at the end of the book after he's gone through all the metaphysics and so he kind of cross references you to the different um uh, metaphysical issues which are going on in each of the ways and with Wh whipple you you just get like almost an encyclopedic level of reference to the secondary literature on the issue so definitely a good first source for people who just want to engage with this stuff and then follow up with some uh, further reading would be Whipple. When, when I'm dealing with uh, one, any of the ways, I've got articles out on each of the ways, and um, I always turn to Whipple. Uh, and then, you know, that's my initial go to. And then I, you know, look at the secondary sources there. And then looking at the secondary sources, I get secondary, secondary sources and go on and on. And, and usually that's how I go about it. And that gives me a good handle on things. Um, but yeah, so I would really recommend Whipple. Um, for those who can read French, there's the book by uh, Gary Lagrange. Um, God, what's it called? Uh, Je. Uh, so it's got God in the title. Je. Is it uh, son essence, uh, son existence, something like that? God, um, uh, his existence. There's some. It's something like that, but it's got God in the title. Um, I don't think it's been translated yet. But Gary Lagrange has that big book and. I, th I think if I remember correctly, it's, it's, is it God and his existence and his nature? Is, 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 yes. Is that, it's been translated into English. I, I have the two yeah. volumes up on my... Okay, okay. So that, cool. that's that's a great book. Um, and Lagrange is, you know, generally reliable. Uh, yeah, and then that'll point you in the direction of further resources that you can use. And I also think that uh, Cornelio Fabro would also be helpful uh, in, mm. in, in this department. And then there's, there's there's a few volumes that have been translated into English by uh, by, by Whipple, if memory serves me right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or just, I mean, do what I did. And from, from what I've been told Whipple did, Wh Whipple learned Italian so he could read Fabro. And, nice. and that, I, I heard that story secondhand. So... Um, so I'm trusting the secondhand source, and uh, okay. I I learned French just to read Fabro uh, as well. So gotcha. So you could you could learn you could learn French and Italian uh, to you know to, to be able to read these authors. In fact, um, I hadn't been using my Italian for a while, and when I was researching the Fourth Way article, I had to read uh, the the there's an article by Fabro in Italian. Don't even ask me to say the title because you'll you'll get Italian in a Belfast accent. <laughs> nice. But um, I, I had to I had to go back to my Italian again, so it got me to freshen up uh, uh, reading Italian again, which was nice. So it, it came with m more more blessings than just a publication. Gotcha. Well, Gavin, thank you so much for joining with us. It's been a pleasure. Not at all. It was great. Always happy to be on.